Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Rich Chuknowitz. Rich is the VP of Engineering and Product Operations at Four Moms. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming back on, Rich. Good to see you again. No problem. So, um, what did you think of PRN Discovery Day? Pittsburgh Robotics Network, for people listening. Yeah, it was pretty good. Um, well, there's an interest. So, from a professional standpoint, I'll save that for next, but from a personal standpoint, I thought it was really awesome. Um, got to meet up with a lot of people I haven't seen in years in the like industrial robotics space. Got to see a lot of other cool stuff that was happening. So I think from that side, it was really, really neat. The professional side was interesting because we were showing um, Four Moms' products. And surprisingly, you got a lot of people that came over to us and they were like, oh, you know, how's that a robot or why is that a robot? And it's Oh, like, interesting. And it actually, it even splits further than that. So I would say most of the... Um, so during the day, they had a high number of like high schools come in. I noticed that, yeah. Yeah, so there was all like, of our circuit business cards got snatched up within like five seconds. Yeah, they were just <laughs> it was everywhere. That place like it couldn't even get across like the hall to the next booth over. It was like ten feet, fifteen feet wide. It was just chock full of like high school kids. But they were actually pretty good. They they knew it was a robot. They totally got it. We had our um, uh, a clear Mamaru that we shot in clear plastic so they can see all, oh, that's the, cool. all the stuff going on inside. And, uh, what kind of plastic? Like um, we j- it's just a clear ABS. Okay, so, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, it's a little, a little more expensive, but we had, um, before we textured our tools, we had them shoot a clear ABS enough for building five of those. That's so awesome. right before Discovery Day, they took a Mamaru, gutted it, and then threw all the guts into a clear unit, and then we brought it to the, uh, the show. That's really cool. So... But uh, all the high school students are really cool. They they totally get why it was a robot, and they're actually really asking really good like technical questions. But then later in the day, it shifted to more like non high school, middle schooler kids. Uh, it was all like adults and stuff, and a lot of them were just asking like, "Oh, why is that a robot? Why is that here? That that doesn't fit the big industrial self driving car that's at the end of the hallway." And it's like, well, actually, it is a robot, and this robot is got you know is built in volumes that are like orders of magnitude higher than pretty much anything else in this space correct so <laughs> it's like it is a robot but yes it is a a bassinet or a swing but it's you know it is a robot it's just different than the big things you see here yeah yeah for sure i i feel bad i didn't get to see your booth because i was just so busy trying to man mine as one person which was uh i should say mine uh, ska is the company i work for and also own and so, <laughs> I mean, but, it was busy. So yeah, it was, I can't it was even crazy. I think there were like thirty five hundred people there, mm. and so the high school kids were insane. I, I would have thought like the family crowd might have actually been good for four moms, but I guess it doesn't really matter because at the scales you guys are selling, they already know about it. The ones they're going to buy it. That was the thing. Yeah, yeah, people either. I mean, I guess it's the case with four moms any given time. It's people know exactly who they are because they're of an age of either having grandkids or their friends are having kids or they're having kids. So we just did the Dolly thing for for people listening. (laughs) And Dolly, like OpenAI's art generator, knows what a Mamaru is. So you can have it make, we did a steampunk Mamaru. (laughs) It was right there. It made a steampunk Mamaru. I guess the the name is unique enough that it can filter out all the pictures of Mamarus and cobble together or something. It was pretty awesome. But um, yeah, I mean, the show was great. A um, lot of good interest from you know all people everywhere and got to see a lot of really cool stuff that's happening in Pittsburgh. Um, spent a lot of time over in the uh, the educational section, I guess it was. Oh, like, I didn't even make it over there. Oh, it was pretty cool. It's, it's all like the high school robotics team. So you got to see their like VEX robots and FIRST robotics and they were like pitching rubber balls. Next time and I got to bring stuff. another salesperson or two. <laughs> yeah, I think if you get like even a couple of minutes to like run over, it's pretty cool. They were launching their like the rubber ball like 30 feet in the air and catching it and doing a bunch of cool stuff. But they caught it? Yeah. That's challenging. Yeah, because I think the the one, they, the competition they were set up for, they have to like collect these rubber balls and then they have to like throw them into like goals as fast as possible. So they have these really cool like sweepers and then it's got like a vertical conveyor belt so it can just like throw a deluge of like dodge balls out. Oh, that's pretty and awesome. And then some of them will launch them like really high up and because I guess there's like different positions you can play because I think it's like a team competition so you can have like an offensive or a defensive robot. And so you're passing and you can have a receiving function? Some robots have like a receiving for the ball, some have both and then some are just like really good precision because I guess the way they, they set up first competitions is so that they can have um, lots of different strategies that people can go for. So yeah. there's like a precision high point goal or there would be something it's a low point but if you do volume 
you can like get a lot Deluge of your way into the exactly and yeah. it depends on the game and stuff like that so there's all those different robots and some of the booths had like 3d printers set up so they're all yeah. running little prints and things so was i was cool. really happy to see bots iq represented and i only knew that because they came by ska's booth and so i was like i love you guys <laughs> yeah I, I went to one of their competitions back when i was at cmu i, I got to guest judge or whatever and oh that's awesome it was pretty cool it was uh well, terrifying too, because they would have like a microwave in there, and this thing's got like just a wood, little robot that's probably I don't know, the size of a pounds. lunchbox. Yeah, yeah. fifteen pounds. It's got like a wood chipper on the front, and just decimates anything that goes in there. Yeah, a lot of them you were using uh, hardened S seven, I think, for the weapons. So that was really popular material with those guys. Yeah, it's like hardened steel, and a lot of them will use the um, like horizontal spinner, so it launches anything it hits like yeah. through the air. And yeah, those things terrifying. are awesome. <laughs> I, I really really like it. What I like about, I mean, I, I've been involved in numerous first teams, and I mentored the girls of Steel at Carnegie Mellon. I have no disrespect for first, but what I like about Bots IQ more than first <laughs> is that um, they have no uh, constraints on what they're allowed to use so long as it hits their weight limit and like isn't an EMP. Like there's a few rules, but they can use you know drives from any manufacturer. They can mm -hmm. use any type of alloy that they can get their hands on. They can use you know any type of bearings. It doesn't have to be from an approved kit. So I feel like that gives the kids a lot more freedom um, to be, you know, creative and, and come up with weird, interesting, you know. Yeah, it's kind ideas. of the difference between like was it NASCAR, where it's like this is the stock car, this is exactly what you use. It's more about skill and a little bit of engineering, whereas the other one is like I guess F one, where it's a lot more like you can do a lot more technology. And I didn't realize F1 was like that. So you can, I got to watch it's Drive got, to Survive. It's got more freedom than NASCAR, but it's still got restrictions. It's That's not like an all like, I wish there was a race thing where it was just like all over. To do whatever you want. Whatever you want. You got a solid rocket booster in the back of your car, go for it. Like That would be fun. <laughs> I would watch that. That would be, yeah. Wacky races. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably wouldn't be a good spectator sport just because people would probably get blown up by whatever shrapnel. <laughs> Yeah, probably. But I mean, you know, you could do it safely. Like maybe you have like cameras viewing. Yeah. You've got like satellite imagery and you just clear out, you know, like the salt flats or something. Yeah. I mean, they've been trying to do the, um, was it the electronic F1 for a while and then the autonomous Have F1. you been following? Yeah. I was going to say the Indy Autonomous. We just sponsored a team. Oh, cool. And so, um, yeah, it was uh, less expensive than you would think <laughs> to do so. If Four Moms wants to sponsor that Carnegie Autonomous Indy Racing Team. Yeah. I'll put you in touch. I'll look, I'll look in that. <laughs> so, no, they're great. And so I got to check out what they've got. And they've got one of these student... They've got a bunch of projects. So one thing they've got is... And I'm probably going to fuck something up. So please, you know, uh, send me a message and we'll correct it. Uh, mm -hmm. But they've got a 10th scale, I think. Um, I think it's 10th. But they've got a, a miniature one um, that's got some autonomy on it. So that was really neat to see. Um, and they're running some interesting algorithms on that. I think it was a stereo camera and a LiDAR um, that I saw mounted on there. They had a Velodyne puck and maybe it was a Z cam. I don't remember exactly what they were running. Um, and then they had like last year's uh, electric Formula SAE car was, um, they were making it autonomous. So that mm. was kind of neat. So they had, um, I want to say it was a high voltage system. So it was like, I think their idea of high voltage was somewhere between, I can't remember if it was like in the 300 volt range or if mm -hmm. it was in like the 150 or so volt range, but it was like one of those two. And then they had a 24 volt system to power the, like the control logic. Mm -hmm. um, and then they probably had some stuff running lower than that that was down regulated, but it was kind of neat. Um, and then I guess in tandem to that, they were developing like next year's uh, non-autonomous um, Formula SAE car and then in addition to that they were also working on the autonomous Indy race car hmm. which I think follows more of like the NASCAR stock model because I think they're like I think they're like three million dollar cars and so like multiple universities will get together and work on one together hmm. so the CMU team it was like CMU Berkeley and then like one or two other universities that I can't remember who they were um, but like all working together on the same car hmm. and then they had a race at uh, CES this year. Cool. So yeah, just kind of neat to, to see all the stuff they're doing. It's a 90 person student org and I was really, really impressed by um, like 
the level of business sophistication. So like the MBA students are getting involved and they've got like a 20 or 30 person just business division that's like handling, you know, the, the sponsors and coming up with ways to raise more money for it and doing like all the press releases. And it was kind of neat, like just the level of sophistication for a student org. Yeah, Formula SA, I remember, is one of the larger orgs back in the day when I was at CMU. Because I think it was when they were moving us from Plantera Robotics building, the um, Formula SA was right up the hill. They were like, it was like. You say us, you mean the. Uh, Robotics Club. They were moving Robotics Club out of the Plantera Robotics building. And and then they were moving Formula SAE out of this garage. They had this tiny garage. It was like. I think they still do. They, they've got one in Newell Simon. So they, they they ended up moving them to the, there's like this big 1,600 square foot space underneath the parking garage by the University Center. At least, I don't know if they're still there, but it was huge. They're they're on B level of Newell Simon Hall now. Okay, so they got moved back over towards the main Yeah, garage. it's okay. a tiny garage. Yeah, if you come machine. out of Newell Simon, you're looking at, is it Smith? The one right across the little area there. So to the left um, is the... Is the Hamburg I'm thinking of, maybe? Maybe it's Hamburg. Hamburg Hamburg's is like closer Hamburg's. to Forbes, and then you've got Null Simon between there, and then there's Gates over here. Yeah, so there's Hamburg. I can't remember which one is Smith. Yeah, there's Hamburg, and Smith is the little tiny bit. Maybe it's been cannibalized and just put into Hamburg. Smith now. might still exist, because okay. that sounds familiar. It's I a little building. Like, there. you go outside Smith for 20 feet, or outside I feel like Smith 20 feet. Out of date now. And now you're in, like, Hamburg. Man. Yeah. There's like a moat of, well, there used to be. I, I haven't been to campus in a while, but there's a moat of pavement between Smith and Hamburg. That's interesting. I always heard they were going to do plans. They were going to just call it, like, put glass over and call it, make it like an atrium. They Wait. just connect the space. So. Oh, interesting. I mean, they've got so much money. Like, yeah. Yeah. I got They're, um, they're slowly going across the Panther Hollow, uh, State Valley Valley there. Pitts territory. Yeah. They bought that gas station a long time ago. It's, oh, I remember that, which is now the Integrated Innovation Institute or whatever. Yeah. They call I think they're it. just holding that until they turn it into something. Because the CMU is actually pretty cool. They, they publish a. It's like a 10-year master plan every 10 years. I didn't realize they were publishing that. Yeah, you just go online. You can search like Carnegie Mellon master plan, and you go online. You can yeah. see like, hey, we have this space. This is what we'd like to use it for. And yeah. you can get an idea of what they're doing. They don't always stick to it. But it's cool. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that'd be interesting because I feel like <laughs> like they're just like, they just have so much money in their endowment that they're just like, Oh, well, we'll, we'll bulldoze this one. We'll put three more there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get as much land as we can. Oh, that house is up for sale? Ours well, now. Well, they used to, they bought, like, across the street from that innovation center, there was a place called, like, the Holiday Bar and oh, other bars. That's the one that's, like, this other address they've got now. I've, I think I've had a meeting or two there. Yeah. I was they, like, wait, what is that building? They bought the old, there used to be a PNC bank. They bought that. And I actually went there to give some talks on, like, IoT devices. Oh, cool. And then, um, but yeah, they bought that whole little swath between, I guess it's the um, art museum and the the hollow, uh, Panther Hollow area. When are they just going to acquire the art museum? Like, I feel like that's next. I mean, I guess because it's a Carnegie, they're already... I was going to say, the part of the name's already the building. <laughs> <laughs> Better they're protected because it's, yeah, it's the same brand. <laughs> yeah, I know they, I, for a period I worked at... Um, CMU housing, like moving furniture for like a summer job, and uh, they actually own a lot of property up on the hill behind the dorms, like where um, Hammerschlag dorm is, and um, kind of all those dorms on. Is that where all the like the fraternities are? Yeah, like okay. up behind that hill. Uh, well, no, sorry, the fraternities like are on Forbes, but I think well, there's other there. fraternities that are on like. Like, there was, like, uh, an African-American fraternity there, if I remember correctly. Spirit. Yeah, Spirit. Yeah, yeah, it's that hill behind Spirit. They yeah. actually own a lot of properties up there, which I didn't know. They actually bought, like, houses up there, and they actually rent them to, like, professors when they get hired, if they need a place to live. Oh, that's Why? interesting. They, they let them live there, and then eventually they move on. But We like, own you completely. Basically. <laughs> it's kind of actually how it was working there, because you... Uh, you worked, and that they gave you the option for free housing, but the moment you stopped working, if you quit or got fired... You lose your housing, so you're motivated to. Do you have like a grace period, like you know, like you can have it. For I think two you weeks. had 24, 48 hours to get out. That's it. Yeah, it was very brief. To move all I, your stuff. I ended up moving. I just moved, moved off campus because yeah. I didn't want the leverage on me. But like, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, I knew some people who got fired or whatever, and they're just like, get out today. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> they must have. That's interesting because I feel like even when you're doing, um, you know, like regular retail. Um, rentals like 
you know, you've got squatters rights or whatever. Mm. They must have some kind of loophole for why it doesn't count as that. Yeah, that's actually a good question. Do I don't know how they, they yeah, because I guess you you probably signed some agreement yeah. when you got campus housing before you. But yeah. that was 12 years, or no, 16 years ago now, so yeah. it's probably very, actually more than that because it's a sophomore year, 18 years. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I guess I mentioned uh, that SKA donated to the um, racing team. I don't know. Um, I got. <laughs> I don't know if we should talk about this, but I will anyway. I got. I got solicited by CMU alumni donations mm-hmm. a little bit ago, and I, I was get, like, I as get. I recall, I already gave you one hundred fifty thousand dollars for a master's degree. Like, <laughs> I get them every probably about once a quarter. I don't think it's more frequent than that, but that's my <laughs> same mindset as you got my whatever one hundred grand, two hundred grand from tuition and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> It's like if I'm gonna do it, I'm just gonna give it to Robo Club or well, that's whatever it. organization. Like, I, I, I love giving to student orgs. Like I've yeah. I've given to Robo Club, I've given to the you know, CMU autonomous indie racing team. I will continue to give to student orgs, you know. But to their credit, it, on that yeah. alumni form, you can write for Robo Club or for Formula SA and they will they have to send Well that's it pretty cool. To and group. like they're what I do like about them, so like, you know, talk a lot of smack, but like on the bright side, you know, like CMU matched our donation to the autonomous racing team because yeah. we did it on a certain day. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of cool. It's yeah. like, okay, just put some fire in the pipes. Yeah, I mean, as a student, they do a lot of good work too. Like, well, and like, like Surge you know, and all those other grant programs they have. Exactly. And if it hadn't been for that, I mean, you know, like my undergrad would not have been nearly as, as awesome and great as it was. Like, I mean, I'm so grateful to organizations like the CMU or Box Club just for existing and, yeah. you know, allowing, you know, interested students to pursue wacky fun projects yeah i heard about i don't know if i'm going to be able to do this but i was i was talking to one of the robo club students now and apparently they've uh, automated the couch that you and your crew built so that it now goes um like 15 miles per hour <laughs> so, i remember we talked maybe we joked about doing that at one point yeah they, they've yeah. apparently done it i don't know how well it works but I'm like, can I get a video of me like ra- racing? That would do so well on LinkedIn. <laughs> so like a LinkedIn virality perspective. I see people do that for like recliners, just because they're not so <laughs> wide. And just trying to think about now, how do they navigate that? I, don't know. I guess I haven't been to Robo Clubs. I don't know. Like when we were there, it was so. I just want a meme video of me zooming by on a just, couch. <laughs> yeah, that hallway is so narrow too. It's like, got to be the couch that you built too. Like it's got to be yeah, the same one. Yeah, the the robotomen. I couldn't find Robot- pictures. <laughs> the robot ottoman that we did for That's a class. Hilarious. That was gone by the time I was in there. I did not see the robot ottoman anymore. Yeah, I think I left it over by the furniture, but someone probably pitched it and they didn't need it or whatever. Yeah, but, brutal. Yeah. That would have been a fun one to, uh, to ride around. Were you one of the people that did that hexabot, like the hexapod? Yep. Nice. Still up on a shelf somewhere? Uh, I don't know, but I my contribution was I put tennis balls on the feet because it kept marking the pavement. Oh, I think because yeah, I used I think I used corks or something. I got to make nice. master as the feet. That's awesome. I yeah. found it and it just had um, like the uh, steel extrusion, so I just stuck a bunch of tennis balls on mm. it. It's, that was like one of the first things I did, just because I found it on a shelf and I was like, ah, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's like some picture of me with hair on top of it, <laughs> you know, like back when I was like 22 or whatever. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'd be very curious to see what it, uh, I hope they have that open house. So you, before pandemic, they used to have like a April open house. So after MoBot, they would have open house. So everyone can go down there and see the club and they have food and stuff. I don't Is know MoBot stuff. officially through RoboClub? I didn't even realize that. No, it was always held by Something the uh, right. computer science school okay that makes more sense because they did it it would would always be noon friday of carnival and then um it was an alternative to people who didn't want to watch the uh, buggy races yeah i always liked mobot better yeah i always went to mobot and then a couple like i think it was my when i was in elementary school we went to mobot like i was at winchester thurston down okay yeah and we had this um i can't remember what it was called it was like the technology club or something Mm -hmm. and it was like like the guy that ran the IT department and like a bunch of kids would like go and check out the Mobot. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. I mean, yeah, you get to see these robots outside and running down there for 
whatever the weather conditions are. And I always remember people being out there like the night before trying to do the last programming of their units. And When did they drop that on you, what the pattern had to be to get through that helix looking thing? I think they tell you the final gate configuration. I think it's 42 or 72 hours before that is, the race. That is wild. Yeah. Not as bad like these days as it would have been in the 80s or 90s, I feel like. Oh, yeah. I mean, the two ways of doing it were either IR sensors, which was probably the most prevalent, or... Uh, Not anymore. I think camera. it's cameras now. Cameras is probably easier. In fact, I, saw, I heard someone made like an app on the phone where you can just literally take your phone and then connect it to a base and then That's interesting. It. What's the interface, I wonder? Yeah, I guess like a Bluetooth or something. Yeah, or USB, something maybe. Like, or USB, yeah. Probably an Android phone. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. The iPhone won't let you do that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't gone the last few years because of pandemic. I'm not even sure if they had it. They're still having it, but um, yeah. I mean, Robo Club would help volunteer. Let me know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have to ping them and see if they're doing yeah. it this year. That'd yeah, be fun to check out. Yeah, I do remember when I was in Robo Club, there were always a few people working on it. And then when I went, like, as a student in the late 90s, like, as like a kid, basically, um, one of the coolest ones I saw was like that downhill section, I guess, would like catch people up. Yeah. And so somebody put like, the most janky braking mechanism on their on their robot. I think it was like a servo with like a paper clip or like just a metal bar attached to the horn with a right angle at the end. Hmm. And it would just like push against the back of an RC car tire and slow it down. Hmm. It was surprisingly effective. Like that one did really well. The one I've heard about and was only told, and I think I saw a very brief clip of it, was um, so with Mobot, you just have to go through the gates in sequence. You don't have to follow the line. So each oh, gate has numbers that. one through fourteen, I think, or fifteen. That's really interesting. So someone built a, a blind I call it the blind man robot, but it, it was a robot that has stick and it would just sweep. <laughs> We'd try to feel the gate. So if it felt the gate, it would back up, move, and try to feel like where the areas of the gate were and then try to drive through. And that did well. It got through like one or two gates. But, <laughs> but like after you get to the second gate, I think that's where it goes down the hill and everyone gets screwed up by that. So the the robot with the the three foot long like <laughs> stick on the front can na navigate the hill. So I would think the stick might get stuck at the bottom of the hill even. Yeah, the year I did the walking robot, the the, the hexapod, um, someone did a rat. A rat? A rat. So they, like an actual real life rat. Yeah, an actual little like lab rat, like little hooded rat that they basically trained to go to the gates. <laughs> and um, I think it was like rat, in a hamster ball or was it just out on a Just sun? just the gate, uh, just the rat. <laughs> like they just entered a rat. Yeah, they just, there's nothing against it. Yeah, that's amazing. So like the, the only hour? rule is you have to go through the gates in sequence and you have to fit through the gate. So it's really the only two rules when that's you That's hilarious. Go Did they put a cape on it? No. It, it actually I don't even remember if it went through the first gate or not because um the crowd, it was just like freaking out over like all the people around that it. That makes sense. And so it didn't get too far. But they gave them, there's the, there used to be the thing called the Judges Award where it's basically a wild card of anything that seemed interesting. So they gave the rat the, the 100 book award, which was annoying. <laughs> it's a lot of I, money for a student. Yeah, because I, I, I think it was like one of the first people to enter a walking robot to Mobot. So oh, I was hoping to win that, so I got screwed by, over by a rat. So, but whatever. That's, did you use the same mechanism as in the Hexabot? Uh, for which? Well, well, of rocking robots, I always thought that hexapod uh, one with the extrusion was interesting because it was like a, I don't know if it was a four bar linkage, but it was all mechatronic. Like there Yeah, was a, it was just a mechatronic robot hexapod, so it had yeah. a four bar linkage for the vertical up and down. You must have leg. used the same proportions and mechanism as you used on that bigger one that was human, human writable. Oh, that was a different, per that was rich... Patel, he's a different other rich. This is a different rich. Yeah, there was another rich. He he made the big walking one because I remember seeing videos yeah. of that at one point. That's the one that I, I put tennis balls on. That one. Okay, yeah. I thought you were talking about the little one. No, okay. I was talking about the big one. Though. Yeah, no, that was Rich Patel. At, uh, I think he's at Emrock now. Oh, cool. But yeah, he was a year or two below me, and then I do remember seeing that. Or, yeah. I think I already graduated. The that thing was hilarious. Movie. It was huge and really yeah. cool looking. Yeah, yeah, I really <laughs> liked that one. Yeah, I. I Ever since I watched Wild Wild West in the late 90s, which is not a great movie, I always... It's a horrible movie, but it's great robot. steampunk, yeah, the mechatronic steampunk stuff spider is, stuff. Exactly. It wasn't even... It was straight up robotic, like it was, <coughs> which never would have made any sense by, you know, the technology that they're espousing at work done. No, but I feel like a lot of steampunk stuff is like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the steam power is not enough to move the massive... Hundred tons. Well, also, like, thing. what is it, like mechanical computer that you're figuring out the walking gates with? Yeah. Like, 
Well, it's all valves, right? You just get yeah. the valve timing right and then pull lever. No. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and then the guy has like a like a kite that he gets it with. <laughs> like it was flying devices and stuff. Yeah, it was like it was so silly um, and just unrealistic and and ridiculous. But I mean, as a kid that liked mechanical things, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's one of those movies that just drives creative side, not not reality. For sure. Yeah. I mean, and there's there's a bunch like that. Um, I wonder if the Goonies would count, or if that's like just its own. Thing. Oh yeah, no, I think Goonies is definitely up there. It's just yeah. like the crazy special effects. Although I would say the Goonies is like probably a better piece of art than Wild Wild West. Oh, it definitely did better. Yeah. Maybe after I don't know. I don't know how well Goonies did in the theater. It was one of those movies that did better as like post theater. Yeah, it's definitely got a cult following now. I, I will still watch the Goonies and get a big smile across my face. Yeah. <laughs> Like the truffle shuffle scene, I'm like, ah, you wouldn't even be able to make that now, yeah. I feel like. There was like the, the slinky with the little teeth, when, um, what's his name, falls, he shoots out the slinky thing out of his hand to <laughs> keep him. Oh, yeah, with it, the, the cheesy. Yeah, the little yeah. cheesy plastic, like, yeah. teeth thing that, like, grabs it and holds, you know, 60 The pounds. weight of a kid. The weight of a kid <laughs> yeah. falling 40 feet. Yeah, I'm sure. And it's a slinky. But... Yeah, that's totally gonna work. Yeah. Yeah, there were some great bits. I mean, like, the pirate ship, like... You know, yeah. the fact that, yeah, I mean, the whole thing was, was great. The villains were, like, totally silly and over the top. And, yeah. You know, like, somehow they made them, like, evil enough that you kind of rooted against them, but not so evil that it wasn't a kid's movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. It's very good 80s. Yeah, for sure. It probably represents the 80s very well. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> another, another good one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, anyone listening that was hoping to learn about uh, advanced robotics technology. <laughs> it's all motivation, right? It all, it all yeah. motivates people for their design principles. Well, I guess that's way. true. Like, what made you want to get into the engineering, like, initially? Let's see. I distinctly remember, like, so my background is very much mechanical engineering. I'd be... I'd, Distinctly remember just being very much into Legos and Kinect were probably my like my jam growing up and building with that and then I think the biggest thing was just finding like um, watching Discovery Channel and them talking about robotics. I was like, oh cool. Actually no, uh, take that back. It was Discovery was very much on like T V special effects, movie special effects. Yeah, for okay. Robotics. We might have talked about this. I think we did talk me, about that, that too. Yeah. Yeah. And actually went like took a slant towards like special effects industry and like doing an, like animatronics. And you like, realize um, there's no money in that. Yeah, like Winston <laughs> Studios who did like the, the dinosaurs for Jurassic Park and being like, wow, that's really cool. And then you read more about the industry and like being a worker and being like, you know, basically like 300 hour weeks of like just not no sleep trying to get minimum this, wage, minimum wage. And I'm like, wow, that sucks. Yeah. Um, and then being like, well, if you want to make money. You can kind of do it in like robotics, like academic and like spin off companies and stuff like that. At least at the time, it's probably more likely now than it used to be. But and then hearing about CMU and everything and getting yeah, kind of makes sense. driven towards there. So, yeah. So, I don't know. Any interesting stuff uh, you've been working on at Four Moms? Uh, you were telling me you just got the Mamaru 5 out pretty recently. Yeah, we just launched our fifth generation of the Mamaru that came out, launched in the summer, July, August sometime. Um, so it's our fifth generation. mamaru has been out in the world for coming up on, I think it's over 10 years. So yeah, I think the first one launched in 2010. So we're 13-ish years. Can you say like how many units you guys have sold of that product at this point? Uh, through all of them, it's definitely over 2 million. Holy moly. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So really, really cool. Never thought I'd work on something that had two million copies or versions of itself out in the world so yeah it's definitely what are some of the changes you made between the different versions so when i started the uh, first generation mamaru was already out I actually created this like whole fun powerpoint for the company to actually show all these changes but from a high level the first generation came out um there were some small changes like soft goods improvement based on like customer feedback um that was already happening and then i joined four mom four moms right around then um, worked on the second generation, which basically boosted the speed, effectively doubled the speed for vertical and horizontal, because we got a lot of people who are like, oh, it's not fast enough, my kid's not falling asleep, it's not soothing, and 
Um, Make it go faster. That'll be soothing. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> that's, I, I guess that makes there, sense. There's a the point. point so this, motion, yeah. Right, because like people will hold their kid and they'll bounce oh. them like this. <laughs> yeah. And but the Mamaru, I think at the time was something like speed wise. Oh, I Like see. at the fastest was something like that. So it doesn't really emulate. So it didn't motion. really emulate, despite the tagline being at the time you know, like it moves like you do. Um, yeah. So we made it faster. Nice. Um, that was really good. Third generation was the first time we dabbled with uh, Bluetooth, so we put like a Bluetooth remote, so you could um, kids have basically proximity sensor. So if they're like chilling or you know don't see you, they they definitely perceive through. I think it's probably through smell, heat, whatever. But if you come near them in the Mamaru, they'll um, you know, basically start seeking your attention and they'll give up on the Mamaru. So we had a lot of people ask about Bluetooth functionality, or remote functionality, so we did that in an app. Oh, that's interesting. So we you know now you can be. 20, 30 feet away from the Mamaru, see your kid, and then like change the speed, motions, whatever you need to do. Nice. And then, let's see, fourth generation um, was basically, I'm trying to think of a big difference there. So just a further refinement, usually every two to three years we do like an aesthetic refinement, so we refine like the soft goods, um, sometimes the hard just goods. freshen it up. Basically. Freshen it up, yeah, like the yeah. UI is usually an easy one that we change to just make it look a little bit more modern, and every four to, Six years will change like all the plastic just because the cost that's sunk into designing those tools to kind of you know, change that design. We don't try to do that as often. That makes um, sense. So then we had the Mamaru 4, which just had mostly aesthetics. I'm trying to think if there was any other functional differences there. I think maybe some sounds were different, but it wasn't like a radical difference from the, the 4. A lot of it was under the hood, a lot of cost savings nice. uh, things. So things that were metal, die cast, we changed to plastic to get cost down and things like that. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And then the fifth generation, which we just launched, had a couple improvements. We um, changed all the aesthetics, so the outside plastic is different. The um, user interface used to be a touch buttons with a um, LCD screen that kind of showed you the speeds and the motions and everything yeah. that the product does. Now we switch to a capacitive touch just because... Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, helps reduce costs. It modernizes it. Most that's things. amazing that that reduces costs because you would think that's a way more complex thing than a bunch of buttons. Well, there, it is and it isn't. So like, it reduces costs because it is more streamlined from a manufacturing site so they can just pump out this board pretty quickly and then yep. you put it in and there's no buttons or any other assembly labor. Labor is really the thing you're fighting at like volumes of millions plus. Oh, interesting. that makes sense. So that's probably the biggest thing because you're paying, you know, several dollars an hour in labor on yeah. these units. So anywhere you can avoid the, the, the human side of it and automate. So SMT machines are yeah. really, really fast and just spit out boards. So if you can do the cap touch on that, you don't have to worry about a worker trying to assemble anything else. That's pretty it. awesome. So you get better stuff for less money. Exactly. So okay. that's that's the thing. So we, we updated at the capacitive touch. It also like really modernized it because we had this big LCD and I'll, I'll never forget. This was like the moment I was like, all right, we have to go to some sort of touch thing because uh, uh, at the time our CTO, oh, Henry, sorry, I'm throwing you in the bus, but he's giggled, <laughs> he's giggled at this because I pointed yeah. out. Um, there's an LCD we were at, I think we were at CMU doing a recruitment um, effort. Is this Thorne? Yeah, Henry Thorne, um, <laughs> who I love to death. So I'm, just, I'm not. I'm, he's a hilarious dude. He's a great guy. He's a legend in robotics. He's, yeah. you know, he's, he's been very, very good. Um, but we were at a CMU recruiting event. We had a Mamaru there, and he, he turns it on, and then he goes to like change the speed, and he touches the LCD. I'm like Henry, Henry, it's not a touch screen. And he goes and he's like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. And like it's a he goes and hits the button, the <laughs> buttons. And I was like, all right, we we next generation, we need to get away from like the screen or go to a touch screen or something. And you know, through development, we found that the most economical thing was to do the cap touch and that makes sense. work with industrial designers to come up with a design that looked very obvious that these were buttons. That's, and that's the craziest stuff like we've done is like working with industrial designers. Like as an engineer, that's the whole realm. Like I never thought I would learn a ton about, but like, it's just so crazy. Cause it's really like, as an engineer, you're wor worried about like the functional design how things operate, performance, things like that. The yeah. industrial de design side is like, it's really the emotional engineering. It's like, how does this, this thing call to you when you're 10 feet away, then there's like three feet away. And then when you're up oh, against it, like that's kind of the really cool breakdown that the designer uh, kind of summed to me at one point is like how to think about it. It's like, do you see this thing like cross the street? Like, how does it call to you? Then, you know, you're at the showroom, you're right up against it. How does it call to you? And then you're using it. You know, how does it call to you to do things you want it to do without That's screwing up? I've never even like, thought about it from proximity's perspective. Yeah, so it's it's really cool. So like, you know, we're 
updating the UI. So that's the, you know, the 10 foot, the 20 foot view, and then like you're up against it. So like little details, like in the soft goods, like the stitching patterns, like how does that look and feel premium? Yeah, you don't notice that until you're up against it. Right, and then like the, U, the UI with all the buttons, like, you know, you look at it, and it's just these icons that light up, but like how do we make this icon look like something you can, you want to touch as a button and make yeah. sure it doesn't get looked at as like, oh, that's an icon, what do I do? Does the iconography in the mobile app mimic the iconography? It does. Mobile? Okay. But you can't bet on every single person using the app. So yep. like, you know, you might have a conversion rate of 50% or less of people who buy this product and actually use the app because it might be a grandmother who buys it. Yeah. Grandson, and like they just want to plug it in and use it. So you have to make sure you have a really good app free experience. But then for the folks who want to use the app. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. They have it. But then like, yeah. So you still have to like make this a really good product and think about how they are going to you know, gravitate towards the buttons or discover that these are buttons and then make sure that they know what each button does. And that's like a whole rabbit hole that you go down with industrial designers with like 12 different layouts of the buttons and different <laughs> designs for each button and how, excuse me, how big the buttons no need worries. to be and everything. And Wireframe to proof. <laughs> basically, yeah. So like, I mean, the nice thing is like 3D printing is awesome now too. So like, I think at one point we had like five or six of these UIs printed out that we would have and we could like swap them and have them real size. And Well, that's really cool. But then there's like small things like even now, like um, the current Mamoru, like from a design standpoint, I don't really like the fact that like the icon lights up to tell you it's active, but like as you touch it, you're covering the icon. Oh. So it's kind of like, uh, it's not the best experience. So like that's the stuff like we think about like for the next generation. Since this is the first generation cap touch, it's like stub and stuff. We didn't really actually think about it. But now like, yeah. now that I've done it, I'm like, oh yeah, that kind of sucks. So like you touch it and like whatever motion it was on, the light was on, then you touch the new one and then the new motion will light up the icon, but you don't know that because it's under your finger. Your finger, yeah. So like, like little things you like You wouldn't that. have figured that out in wireframing because you know you, you don't have a finger on top of it. Or it's just like, you may not even think about it. You're just yeah. like playing around with it and then you're like, oh yeah, actually that kind of does suck. It would be great if like the thing that lit up or indicated was above it. Yeah. Um, so like some of that stuff we've done with our sleep product actually has a capacitive touch screen as well, but it's a... Um, but which product is this? So the one we're talking about is the Mamoru 5, yeah. but the Sleep, it's called the Mamoru Sleep, which is a bassinet version of basically the oh, Mamoru. Oh, I think I've seen this yet. So it has its own capacitive touch. It's just a different embodiment. It's more of a, what's called a dead screen LED or um, UI. So like if the power's off, you just see black. Yeah. When the lights come on, it actually lights up the icons and you can like touch the icons. It's very kind of like sci-fi maybe 90 sci-fi, 2000 sci-fi, I don't know. And yeah. it's like, it's just a black screen that you light and the light, the icons light. Whereas the Mamaru, it's a little bit more basic in that the icons are actually molded into the plastic. So if the lights are off, you can still see the icons. Yeah. It's just the lights actually will light up the icon to tell you that they're activated. And yeah. all you see is the actual icon that's lit When up. you say the icons are molded into the plastic, um, how does that work with cap touch? Because I would think like cap touch is just like a screen. So the cap touch itself is basically, um, Basically, there's a spring underneath the plastic. Okay. So it's a big, like, conical-shaped spring. So you need, basically how it needs to work is that you have to have a large metal antenna just underneath the plastic. So when your finger comes near, it creates the capacitance change between your wet, you know, body of water finger near the metal antenna that's coming up from the board. Yeah. So when you go over it, the, 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 and the oh, antenna's about the size of like a touch icon. screen. So. No, it's not a touch screen, yeah. Okay. It's, it's that's, just a That's actually Different type of capacitive touch, yeah. yeah. Moron over here. No, no, I mean, it's the same capacitive <laughs> theories. It's just applied to a, like, a, a single button. point button versus an entire screen. Yeah. Well, that's actually pretty awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. It actually seems quite sophisticated. You know, it's easier to do them nowadays because, like, a lot of the chip manufacturers will have libraries for that. And I say it's easier because there's still a whole lot of, like, testing you need to do so you have to do like timing tests and like interference tests with the, the actual buttons to get the sensitivity yeah, you sense. want because you know you don't want it to imagine debounce comes into play yeah basically you get like a phantom press if like um you know if the hand waves by it's not close enough but it'll may register and like start changing the like motion you know, yeah <laughs> exactly that's a cool sound no. <laughs> but like yeah so it's easier because the libraries, but it's still a challenge to do capacitive touch right in a good way. That makes a lot of sense. And then you even have like, there was one bug we were chasing down forever, which is um, called it the phantom button press, where 
I think when the light, it turned out to be when the LEDs turned on to a certain brightness, there was noise in the traces oh. in the board that would make it seem like this one button got pressed all the time. So we would have these units in life test mode, which is just they run for hundred, like they run infinitely. And, That's interesting. Um, How many units do you run like that? So, so each phase will do. So like we have a cohort of six, which is like a parameter window of different weights and speeds and stuff like that. We found like to be the most extreme. But then we'll do like multiple of those cohort, cohorts for each like engineering phase. So if we have like a first generation, we'll do somewhere maybe like two cohorts. So it'll be like 12 units, but then like we yeah. get to late. Because in the first phase of engineering, uh, first engineering phase of product, a lot of things don't quite work because you're getting parts off the tool for the first time and yeah. maybe don't work exactly. But for later ones, we'll do anywhere from 30 to 60 units. And that's just at like nice. our office here. We'll also do kind of a simultaneously large number of units at our um, manufacturer in China. Yeah, makes sense. And then we'll also do like field tests and things like that. That's interesting. Why do you need to have, you know, 60 in each location? Uh, like what does that get you over? So like, any variability that might 100? be between here and Asia, so. Is that like environmental though? Because presumably they're all manufactured. Environmentally in or maybe through shipping. Something okay. could have damaged. It'll give us insights if there's like an issue where like if all of our oh, units in Pittsburgh fail and all theirs are running, then we have to do the question like, was it the shipping? Um, were they batched in a different way when they built them? Is there a part like there's a whole like basically system of investigation you have to like unleash to like figure out why these two batches are different? Because that's really interesting because yeah. they're all made in the same place. They're all made in the same place, but yeah, these guys went through a moving different. It, so it could be environmental, it could be shipping, and probably more likely shipping. Potentially, we've had cases where they just built them on different days and they had different parts or different issues that caused. Could be that the temperature was different in the facility where they made it. I mean, that's the issue with any kind of mass manufacturing is like, it's never, like anyone who's getting into like mass manufacturing of something, it's not like, hey, we designed this thing, let's just make a hundred of them. It's, you know, there's small variations in every single one of those things you make. So that could be from like for, for Formons, when we do plastic molding, the temperature gradient between the press and the atmosphere, yeah, that's enough to throw your parts off. Like we actually do see a slight spike in part rejections uh, when you go from summer to winter. That's interesting. Like when it gets colder, like it does. Since we produce in southern China, it doesn't get like freezing. I mean, people who live there, when it gets down to about like fifty degrees Fahrenheit, they think it's freezing because they all wear their down jackets. And so it's <laughs> That's like Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, okay. People wear their track jacket. When it's and I'll like just have like a sweatshirt 60, out there and they're 70. like, oh, are you cold? I'm like, no, this is lovely weather. I love this. <laughs> yeah, it's way warmer than it gets in <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like that air, that changes the cooling rate of the parts. And then if you have the parts are at a different cooling rate, your parts can warp in different ways. So you'll have new issues potentially. Or you might not have any issues. It, it depends on the part and how things are warped. And um you know, we try to mold our stuff in environmentally controlled spaces, but you can't do that for every press because that also drives cost. Yeah, so for you, sure. You have to deal with that very well as well. There's, I don't know if this applies here, but there's one thing that I've sort of seen people do uh, in certain manufacturing operations where they'll change the temperature of the manufacturing operation based on the ambient temperature rather than trying to regulate the ambient temperature. Yeah, that and that's what you're supposed to do. So like we, we do, um, they do logs where they're supposed to say what the ambient temperature is when they're running every hour, they're supposed to do a log and be like, this is the ambient temperature, this is the differential temperature on the, the, the press blocks, you know, what it's cooling out, the cooling rate and everything. So that way, if we do see a spike in rejected parts, we can come back to the logs and try to determine like what were the variables that were driving it. But the theory, the temperature, you should basically come up with like a parameter window for your molding. So uh, the, the pressure, the cooling rate, and the what the ambient is should all be like factors into this like window where you're like all right as long as the ambient is in this range and I'm cooling in this range I've already done tests that say like I can get good parts in this combination of variables yeah it makes sense and you know you should be sticking in there as much as possible yeah so I, okay but you say in theory so I'm guessing that means you have probably logging issues yeah you have issues sometimes issues. like they don't they don't log it right or um, something else changes the press has maintenance so like Oh, well, yeah. cooling line gets clogged with calcium deposits because they didn't filter the water or something. Or maybe the guy, they did maintenance and the cooling line arrangement is different. Um, I mean, there's just so many different variables, so you just have to be on top of it. Yeah, as much as possible. Sense. So, like, how many, um, I guess, what kind of testing do you run in your quality program? At, like, what number of units? Uh, do you do destructive testing? Yeah, so, okay. 
being in juvenile products, we have a lot of, there's, there's compliance and regulation testing that we do, so that'll be checking for it heavy metals and make sure there's no lead or anything in the plastic or any of the other you metal parts. That? So you actually send it off to a lab. We used to have a, 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 um, a piece of equipment called the XRF gun, um, but that was actually kind of annoying to keep around because you have to get it like certified with state because it's got like a radioactive element. Ah. And you have to keep it in a lead line box and then they have to have like the um, Department of Energy come in to make sure that oh, it's geez. still there and it's not getting like pilfered and used for nefarious reasons. But it was pretty cool because you can take a piece of metal Press the trigger and it'll tell you exactly the metal composition. Oh, that's really cool. Tell you like this percent of iron, this percent of manganese, this percent of copper, like everything. It was really cool. That's awesome. Um, although there was one time we took a reading of this part for our car seat and it was like 85% uh, gold. And I was like, what? if this is gold, like I just want to, we can just make a business on getting these things imported because we were only paying them like a dollar fifty. But it's the only time I questioned it. Otherwise, it was actually pretty accurate. <laughs> what we do now is actually work with a third party lab that has the gun, the XRF gun and equipment and you can send it to nice. them and they'll, they'll they'll take the part, they'll swab it or take a piece off or whatever and then run the, 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 the test and then you get a chemical breakdown like here are all the materials that are in it and if it's below a certain PPM, you pass, fail, whatever. That's pretty awesome. And I feel like a lot of companies are, and you know, I guess people sometimes think it's best to do everything yourself and and it's interesting to hear you know just a clear example of when that's not the case yeah i mean when we did we used to have like in-house like reverse engineering capability I and mean, we still have the equipment but we rarely use it because it's just so cheap to like send a part out and pay two or three hundred bucks for them to do like a ct scan on it and then you have like a full cad model of this gear yeah versus trying to like measure it kind of inaccurately in-house and then trying to use your laser and um Put it in and turn on it. Yeah, your, your, <laughs> yeah, your CMM to like measure points. You can just send it out, be done with it, and it's it's all ready to go. That's pretty awesome. But um, yeah, in terms of tests, so it's like the the chemical compliant. So that's the chemical side. The compliant side is like there's certain regulations for like testing the performance of different juvenile products. So like there's a, a swing standard for swing products. There's high chair standards for high chair products, and they'll have various like uh, labeling. And packaging like warning requirements then they also have like performance requirements so like the mamaru has a an incline test where you gotta put weight in a uh, certain weight in the seat and then the seat has to be on an incline of, i think it was like 20 degrees and you have to put it in all angles to oh, make sure it doesn't flop over and you, know. you just gimbal the base to, in order to do that i mean you must have some degree of automation there no so that, that so that's a test we have to do we do every year just to renew but it's just like a, a physical performance oh, test it doesn't okay. have to do that it's kind of just a making sure your seat is designed so it's in like a, a validation test yeah it's a safety validation so this yeah. this this these standards and these tests are actually come up with a committee by uh, through astm um, which is an organization of like, there's like CPSC is on there. There's members of other uh, juvenile product manufacturers. There are safety advocates who are in there and they all kind of talk and discuss like, hey, you know, we're seeing these kind of injuries in the market yeah. based on the CPSC. If we come up with a standard for this test, we can change the design or make sure the design is not likely to tip over or yeah, have issues and sense. things like that. So. You have um, to revalidate every year. We, we don't have any to. It's kind of weird. So you don't have to do the test, but we do it in case yeah. there's any variation in the production. So if oh, that makes some sense. plastic warps in a way because of bad molding or temperature differentiation, and it causes us to tip our, causes us to fall over in our, our stability test or something like that. Yeah. So we just do as a formality every year on all our products to make sure. Or if we proactively make any changes, we'll also run through that test. To make yeah, sure it makes sense. We do it after any changes. So that's the compliance and regulation side, and then we have like our own internal spec of stuff we develop. Like nice. you know, we, this this actuator we want to basically make sure it can operate you know fifteen hundred cycles. So we'll be like, oh, you know, someone will use this once a day every day for six months, and then um, they'll have two and a half kids. So then you multiply that out and just say, all right, we have to do kids. a thousand because you know, U.S. <laughs> average is two and a half kids, yeah. but they're also not going to use it every day necessarily. So yeah. you come up with models of like, all right, we cycle test, and then we'll do those tests as well. That's awesome. And a part of that uh, test is the, the life test as mentioned, where we, we run the unit for basically well over a thousand hours, different weights and speeds and everything to get a, you know, make sure the unit is performing, not only just like actually performing without any failures, but also like um, sounds and things like that aren't like creating any disturbances for the uh, customers. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah, so a lot of testing. And then, so that testing happens so we talked about the, the regulation, the chemical stuff that's done once a year or whenever it changes. The internal test spec, 
we'll actually do batches every couple weeks of production. And that scales with um, how many units we're producing. So obviously if we're producing a lot more units, we'll probably do that more frequently. That makes and sense. if they're being done less frequently or less number of units, we'll do it. So it's based on uh, acceptable quality limits practices where basically we'll look at you know, however many we'll do when we guarantee we want to make sure we test whatever it is every so often. And then we also do part checks um, so parts themselves, when they're molded, they have certain areas on the parts that we measure on a regular basis to make sure the part is not warped, or at least critical dimensions are not warped. And then any parts that are um, manufactured by any third parties and stuff, they'll also, when they come to the factory, they'll measure some key uh, points on them to make sure they're acceptable. Nice. And that's basically before anything is really built. And then on the line, we'll have uh, test fixtures and things like that for various things. So we'll do like sub assembly test fixtures and we'll check things like the gearbox, making sure it's, you know, running at the speed we want for the current we want and things like that. Is that like every single gearbox or every N number of gearboxes? Uh, for that, for the production line stuff, it's every single unit. So nice. everything that goes through, we'll do that. And then, um, we'll have like end of line tests where they'll put weight on the unit and run everything check sound, make sure nothing else got goofy in the, in the production line. You can automate that with microphones and FFTs and stuff. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fact that you've designed this quality program is super impressive and interesting to me. I mean, I'm kind of just starting to get into that world a little bit, you know, in my career. And I don't know, it's just, it's fun to hear this stuff. I, I, I mean, every day it's... Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to say it's like every day a different problem, but there's always challenges, right? Like, so even if you have a good quality program, there's still like always opportunities to improve. So like you're seeing a 3% failure for this one test for incoming quality. Like it's great that, you know, this test on the production line is catching these issues, but you can never assume that it's also catching 100% of this issue. So you have to assume that some percent of units are still getting through that. Uh, so even though you're seeing 3%, there's probably some fraction of percent that's getting out to a customer. So like you still want to try to get that 3% down. So even with all your incoming quality checks and online checks, you still want to try to like get that number down as much as you can. Yeah. So what do you what do you look at, I guess, when you're deciding like, is it worth implementing another quality check? Like what are some of the things you consider? I think the big thing is just making sure there's consistency. So we, we have checks fairly regularly and we, we try to make sure the checks are at locations where we think there's opportunity for, um, well, I guess, I guess it depends. So if you're starting with a new product, you try, you take your best guess as to like, all right, here are all our main systems, sub-assemblies, let's try to check and test them as much as we can that we're willing to, because keep in mind too, there's also the cost side. So every time you have to test a unit, you're also adding cost through labor. Someone has to do that, put it on there, take it off and uh, move everything. So you don't want to just go willy nilly on the, the tests either. So you have to be smart about the test. For a product that has started, and you're actually getting a little bit more feedback loop. So things from like the field, like customers telling you, hey, we're seeing this, or through later tests, you're starting to see failures. You can now use that as a way to focus in particular areas. So if you're getting a particular failure on a certain motion axis, or you're seeing a particular issue, that'll give you focus. So like, all right, well, this is the test we currently use for this vertical stage, but we're seeing this in the field. We need either to improve the test for that particular area or at another level of testing in the context of a mamaru's life cycle, the field means the customer's home. Correct. Yeah. Okay. The actual customer, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like usually, so the, the main avenue is the product will ship, go to a warehouse, and it will either be sold directly through four moms or through our retailers. But yeah. Yeah, ultimately, the field is the customer. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I don't think of like field in terms of you know cons direct to consumer products like that as much. So I know it's, it's, fun, it's weird. It's, fun it, it's crazy because yeah, when I was in the industrial robotics, it was like the field was literally a sewer out in the street or <laughs> with a municipality that threw it in the sewer. So it was like the field meant the field, yeah. um, and also the scale was different because you know at the time I think before I left Red Zone we had twenty of the small solar robots, which yeah. again felt great because it was like man I, this thing we designed and built we went from one or two to twenty it's, it's insane. And then went to four moms and learned like, huh, that's cute. Scales twenty units. Or can... That's cute. <laughs> yeah. I think at the time we were doing when I started four moms, it was like it was pretty big. It we hit like a thousand units a week. Yeah. Which was pretty impressive. Significantly more than Red Zone. But four moms now does more than that in a day. So is that primarily the Mamaru then? Yes. Okay. Mamaru. Sounds... Mamaru is the big one. Yeah. Yeah, that appears to be the cash cow. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But, I mean, we have our other products, too, and they do very well. Like the um, Breeze Play Yard 
not a robot per se, but it's oh, very much mechanical. Is that the one where it like folds out into Correct. It? Yeah, that is such a cool product. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to like, it, and again, that's one of the things that challenges the breeze is telling people like, unless you have kids, you don't really know how difficult like a lot of the traditional play yards are. Because um, you have to like, the traditional one, you have to set it up, you have to like set up all the horizontal top rail pieces individually. And if you don't do them in the right order, like you can't actually set it up and it fights you. <laughs> but with the breeze, you just basically push it and just Done. And the development on that was actually pretty cool. It was, uh, in the early days, it's it all was wires, actually, right? Hmm? It's wires. Well, now it is, but it actually started as a automated play yard. So Henry Thorne, awesome Henry, love you again. Hey, what's up, buddy? <laughs> um, he made the first prototypes, which were it was automated. You hit a button, and a motor like pulled everything together. It was yeah. actually kind of slow. And he's the one who who looked at the the the, the, the prototype at the time. He's like, that would be faster and easier if you just did it all mechanically. So nice. he actually changed it and took from a, a, a you know I electrical that unit. Probably got the cost down too. It definitely did. You don't have to deal with motors or drives or. It definitely did, and then gearboxes. the team worked to basically bring that to market. And I think it was 2014, 2013 is when the first breeze launched, and it was all it's all mechanical at the time. It was cables uh, and linkages, and I think now it's um, we got rid of the cables in oh, a actually. version about five years ago. We use like push rods now. Nice. To get some of the cost out, so but That's I mean, it's awesome. effectively it works the same way. It's still you push down and it spreads out the bottom legs and the top comes along for the ride, and then it all rigid gets rigid when it gets to the end of travel, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's sweet. I didn't design that. <laughs> I didn't work on it. It was actually um, one of the other engineers there, uh, Jared Rosenthal. He he worked with Henry very closely nice. for many years on that. So yeah, I can't remember. I think the reason I knew about the wires is like I. Henry either was telling me about it or I overheard him talking in an event. I can't remember if it was like a one on one conversation or like me being in an audience somewhere, but I remember thinking that seems like fun. He's very excited whenever he works on something, especially if he learns something new, he's very excited to tell people about it. So yeah. I told you about the cables, it was probably he was working on Breeze at the time and learned something really cool and exciting and wanted to talk yeah, about Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he, he's an interesting dude. I, I like that guy. I was wearing a jacket not that different from this one, um, which that one has like a sateen lapel and it's per, uh, burgundy paisley. Mm -hmm. I got this like custom smoking jacket, ridiculous thing. And he goes, I would never wear a jacket like that. <laughs> He's also brutally honest, which is yeah. good. I, yeah. I kind of love that he said it. I was like, yeah, well, I'm wearing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thanks, Henry. <laughs> But yeah, cool dude though. I mean, obviously his accomplishments are like pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, between that, like the fact that he founded Four Moms, but then also like Omnicell, which is like a totally different company. Well, it's uh, what was it Athon? Oh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, right, Athon, so. Athon, which was the medical tugs. Yeah. Which the uh, little robots that basically <laughs> pulls the um, pulls carts to deliver like medicines around hospitals. They got acquired a couple of years ago by another big medical group. I've, Maybe McKesson. McKesson or Omnicell, I think. I, that's where I think I conflated. There was like an acquisition with another acquisition on top of yeah. it. Yeah. So he did that. And then prior to that, he created a robot who, for anyone who looked at a robot catalog and stuff in like late 90s, maybe early 2000s, there was a robot called Psy. Oh, which wasn't is, that their original product? That was Henry's original product. So I was yeah, this little robot that, that was long and had these two giant spiked wheels, and you could use it to like tug vacuums and carts around your house. And um, oh, that's interesting. He that was sold described that. to me as a robotic vacuum in another. Podcast. Well, it was a robotic vacuum because it towed a vacuum. Like I guess if you turn the vacuum, this is this is before Roomba. So it was like yeah. if you turn the room uh, vacuum on, like a stand upright one, it would tow yeah. it, and then you could use it to like go around your house and vacuum. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, it was pretty cool because, like, he told me the story. I think one time I was over at his house for um, a friend was having a wedding at his house, and uh, I tripped. There was a thing holding a door, and I tripped over it and I looked down. It was a golden sigh. <laughs> and I asked him about it. He's like, "Oh yeah, that was the the hundredth or thousandth sigh robot they sold or something." I was like, "Oh, that was pretty cool." He was just yeah. holding a door. He's like, "Yeah, I just use it for a door stop. It doesn't work." But yeah. <laughs> Um, it's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, so he's yeah he's got some pretty good credentials. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That is that is impressive. Yeah, yeah I um, yeah, I was actually interviewing Prague Batavia, and he told me about that. So mm -hmm. That's 
Yeah. But he said it produced suction. The tug actually makes more sense with the pivot over to the hospital robots, though. Yeah, and that's what he, he uses experience right. from the side to create the tugs, which the tugs, Athon tugs look exactly like side. They're just bigger, and um, but they use similar sensor. I think he ended up saying that they had to put a laser sensor in the, the tugs. Cause well, I mean, that's... It's a higher price market, right? So higher price. It's also sort of like in there. crawling around an environment where there's people walking by. So you yeah. want to make sure you don't run into anybody. Yeah, for sure. And it's bigger. It means it has the potential to do more damage. Yeah. So you probably need a better sensing suite because the consequences are higher if it. Yeah, it doesn't go fast because I actually saw them in. For the first time, I actually saw them in reality. I was um, when we had our first son at McGee. I was. I heard like this beeping. I was like, "What the hell?" I was like walking around, and. Uh, Getting food at the cafeteria and it was <laughs> beeping. I was like, Ooh, "What is that?" I went around the corner and there's a tug right there. That's cool. And that was it. Was just kind of moving around and I was like, "Oh, let's let's see what happens when you get close to it." And I get <laughs> close. Yeah, and I do that stuff. It was like it basically was like, "Excuse me" or something like that. I was yeah. like, "Cool." And I walked away and then it, it kept going on its way. It was like, "Cool." Yeah, I was I was like that the first time I saw one of those Badger retail inventory robots. Mm. I was like, "Ah, let me get pictures of this thing and get up close and see what its sensor suite is." You know, and, and just wave your arms and you see if you can get it to react because, you know, you sort of know what goes into one of those and yeah. what their design considerations might be. Yeah. I also got really excited when I saw the Michael Graves, like, wheelchair with the, I guess there's, like, an, you know, it's the studio that Eli used to work at. Yeah, the, uh, which wheelchair is the one that, like, stands up? Or I think the... it's got, like, a, a red thing on a stick. It might just... I think it's I think it's a wheelchair and then also it's got, like, an IV bag holder, but it's, like, really interesting hmm. design. Like, it's just got a bizarre geometry that I've never seen in anything else. And then hmm. I saw the Michael Graves logo on it. I think it's a Michael Graves and Stryker co-brand, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Although I might be wrong on the Stryker part. But I just I shot a bunch of pictures of, like, I asked a lady in a wheelchair when I was in the uh, emergency room. I'm like, can I take a picture of part of your body, but mainly I want to get a picture of that wheelchair? And she's like, yeah, I don't get it. You know, done. Darn. You know, and I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I said to Eli, he's like, oh yeah, I remember working on that. <laughs> or like, I, I don't know if he worked on it, but he like knew of it. And so you know. it, it is pretty neat to see kind of yeah. like your products in the wild, like with or four like, moms. Yeah, brand you know, where you know people there. You're like, oh, there it is. Yeah, like uh, you're just being in Target and like walking through the baby aisle, like oh, there's the Mamaru, it's right there, and like someone's like looking, and like they'll ask, you know, like one person asked one, so I was like, oh, do you know anything about this? It's like, yeah. Do I know anything about that? <laughs> like, yeah, you know. Just like, what do you want to spend? Like, trying to be honest. Like, I don't want to be like, it's the best thing ever. Like, I just want to be like, you know, what That's are you the looking best for? Type of sales. <laughs> yeah, I'm just natural. And I, th I think they Did they know that. you worked there? Or were they just asking you as a boss? They, they were just asking. Like, I was just standing there looking at it because I was actually doing like competitive research. I just want to see like some of the other competitors and stuff like that. There's other products. Well, I guess that makes sense if you oh, yeah, know them out in the world. Yeah, when the Mamaru like, launched, I mean, there was dozens, of, still dozens of swings. But Mamaru is still one of the only ones that I know of that has two axis motion still. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's tons of alternatives to the Mamaru out there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Have you seen the um, the Amazon robot that they just came out with yet? I think the Astro. Is that the little one that has, like, the iPad face? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's they know surprisingly a cute. A few years ago, but they, they, they were pretty quiet about it. Did they... Announce anything for I buying just, it? Recently? I was over to a friend's house, house last night. Okay. It was the first time I saw one. <laughs> it was, like, it was like way more adorable than I was expecting it to be. Yeah, it's got that, um, I don't want to say Wally, -E, but maybe a little bit more like the yeah, um, o Osmo or Cosmo, the, the, oh, the Anki, Anki robots. Yeah, the uh, now, now Digital, digital Dream Labs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Vector. I actually had David Hanshaw in here as well. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, my son loves Cosmo. Yeah, I feel like that's one of those toys that, like, every venture capitalist I know got that for their kid, mm -hmm. but really it was them that was playing with it. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I was playing, like, the games, trying to figure out, yeah. like, you know, what that sensors engineer. in this cube and the other things. Like, I guess that Ms. Gorski had one for his kid, too. Mm. Yeah, and so it's like, Jason, that's for you. Like, yeah. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I originally bought, I actually bought it several years, because this is the original one when Anki Robotics was still around. Um, so I had, I bought it for myself cause I thought it was cool. And then a couple of years later when my son was born, he noticed it in my office. He's like, what's that? And I was like, Hey, yeah, I don't, I guess I still don't need this on the shelf. So I gave it to him and nice. played around it. And unfortunately the lipo only holds, the battery inside still only holds like, I think you only play with it like 20 minutes before it dies. So. Ah, that's unfortunate. So.
Okay. Got to be an excuse to give Digital Dream Labs some. Money I think I might have to pick up a, a fresh Cosmo. Yeah, yeah. I, I looked online how to replace the battery, and it's very invasive, so I might just buy new. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty. But I mean, yeah. I don't know. I guess to manufacture anything like that, you just kind of it's like probably all glued together and everything. It actually it looks like it comes apart pretty easily, but but I mean, who has time? <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's, it's a time issue. Yeah, uh, I, I've got a laptop um, that this is embarrassing. It got hit by a train. Um, I, I won't go into how that happened right now, but I, I one of my laptops got hit by a train, and it's a twenty five hundred dollar laptop, and I the motherboard still works, the screen is cracked, and all the body panels are dented. It's mm. like an aluminum, like it's like an iBook clone or whatever the uh, Mac product is. Yeah. But it's made by HP, and so I I know it would only take me two to four hours to like move all the parts into new body panels, and I already ordered all the stuff on eBay. But just finding two to four hours where I want to do that on top of being a professional engineering person, I'm just like, I don't really yeah. care to migrate the components from this laptop over. Yeah, the, the value of time is something you definitely learn relatively quickly in your career. I think once once I started dating my wife at the time, I was like, all right, I have less time. Got married. Still had the same amount of time for projects and things. Then my kid <laughs> was born. Like, all right, I got less time. No, my second kid was born in June. It's yeah, like, all right, we got this amount of time, so it's like very, got to be very strategic in like what am I am doing and what I'm not doing. Like, where do you spend money versus time? But, yeah, uh, sounds... It's it's yeah, management of time is definitely big. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, only recently started like taking my car to the dealership for oil changes instead of doing those myself. Cause same. Same thing. Yeah. yeah, I used to just do it in my garage. I was like, oh, well, I could save like 50, 70 bucks, whatever. Or I'll get new brake pads because like I can just buy the brake pads for 100 bucks yeah. online. Like, it's not that difficult. Yeah. I just put the thing up on jack stands. I got jacks. I got a lift. I could just do it. I'll save the money. And I totally did that. And then like start dating my wife. I was like, I'd rather go on a date with her than sit in the garage for a couple hours doing brakes yeah, and exactly. other stuff. So <laughs> it's like, all right, we'll just go to the dealer and drop it off. And it call makes it sense. Out. I think I think the fact that like you know how to do it is respectable. Like, and, and that's then, that's what I tell my wife because she's like, I have propensity for doing like lots of house projects. Like I've done privacy fence around our house. I redid our bat, like remodeled, like ripped out the bathroom, like the shower, everything, and redid it all, and did like this massive, like six foot tall, probably forty foot long, um, uh, retaining wall in our oh, back, cool. old house and stuff like that. And like, I did it all mostly because it was like, hey, I wanted to learn. But, you know, those are very labor intensive projects to the point where like in the future, I now know enough that I don't want to do them again. So yeah, when I go sense. to pay someone to do it, I know what it's worth to pay them. Yeah. So when they tell me it's like X thousands of dollars or whatever, I'm like, why don't we bring that down? Or like, I'll just be like, oh, totally worth it. Like, just take it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I had one the other day where somebody asked me for an amount of money to do a task. This was yesterday. And... Um, it, like, it was a pretty simple task. It was like, I think it was like just a basic graphics manipulation task. And, you know, they asked me, they're like, how about, you know, this amount of money? And I'm like, that seems high. Yeah. They were like, how about this amount of money? I was like, that's more like it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, when we did our privacy fence, I think that kicked it off because it was like, we wanted to do a privacy fence. It was like a quarter, quarter acre, a little less than a quarter acre house. So it was like maybe like 100 feet. 50 feet, 100 feet, something like that in size. And I had a guy come out and he was like, oh, it'll be like 10,000. Another guy came out, it was like 12,000 grand. I was like, or $12,000. I was like, holy crap, like that's insane. And I was like, all it is is like putting some posts in and stuff. I was like, you know, we're not in a rush. We don't need the fence now. We were getting a dog, but we had like some time or whatever. Yeah. And we had an older dog who was fine. He stayed in, like he, he knew the area. So like, I wasn't under a time crunch. I was like, oh, I'll just do it. So all I did was like, you know, every couple of days, like I just dug a hole and then put a post in and cement it and just keep going. And then like, as I had time, I like put up the, the pickets and everything. And you log your hours? You know, that is something I probably will start doing, but yeah. like just from a material cost, I think it was only like 1200 bucks. So it's like, nice. I'm sure I can go in and be like, well, at the time, this is what my hourly rate would have been. Well, not as an engineer, I have to take my hourly rate as a construction worker and like figure that out. But well, I mean, you could back out your hourly rate just from the cost of. That's what I mean. Yeah. It was like it was it was such an. Well, over you could just, figure out the guy's hourly rate from what it took you. I guess, exactly, and, and it was quote, minus twelve hundred, you know, yeah. over a number of hours. And strictly and because, then, like, figure it takes them like you know fifty percent of what it takes you because you're doing it for the first time and they're doing it all the time. And keep in mind too, like, if they did it, they probably would have done it in a day or two. Whereas for me, I did it over 
over like a month or so because again we were we didn't need a fence instantly it was just like oh this would be nice to have so as i yeah. had free time which was nice and i think that's the big recommendation i have for any like home project is like as long as you can live with it in a state of non-use for a period of time consider doing it yourself but it's something yep. like like i don't think i'd do a bathroom remodel again like yeah just because like my confidence with plumbing i hate plumbing yeah like, plumbing is so i've so annoying. I think anyone that's screwed up and like caused a waterfall inside, mm. you know, their house or their apartment, like, you know, is knows it's like not to be trifled with. Oh like, yeah, but mine was even worse than that. It was just a little nefarious, like small leak. Like it was the drain for the tub to the house. Like I couldn't either over tighten or under tighten. Like I didn't get the right amount of tightness for the stupid <laughs> joint. Because <laughs> apparently, like, there's art in plumbing. Not it's not a science. It's not like electricity where you know. Have what gauge wire and what size and everything you have to do. Like you have to That's have the right amount of tension on it and it has to be at the right angle. Otherwise, it just like it just had this nefarious it's little like slow drip. Janky leak. and it's still so that, that's interesting. It was so annoying. So I probably wouldn't do it. You know, a bathroom or at least the plumbing part. I'll, I'll do floor. What do you think the shark like bite stuff? Like I feel like that sort of makes it a little bit easier. It does, and I've done that for repairs. I hear people are hit or miss about like would you do it in a wall or something yeah. like that. So. Like, that whole bathroom over there is all shark bite stuff. So yeah, and I think it's it. fine if you're exce- if it's exce- like in my rental property. There were some pipes I had like I had like a leaking spigot and I need to replace the spigot. I just did a shark bite because it was like easy. I'm not going to get up there with insulation with the, the 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 gas and sweat the pipes and stuff like that. Yeah, so, that sounds... but again, it's all like all right. I did this all for the experience. I now know like where I want to spend my time and where I'm like screw it. Here's here's some money. Go do the tub, do the yeah. plumbing. I'm not touching that anymore because I just... I mean, well, even it's also I, the liability if you screw it up, you know, and you like... It's a liability, but then also, like, I just don't want to worry about it. Like, that was the yeah. thing. Like, it was killing me on the inside of, like, you know, even though I fixed it, like, is it truly fixed? Or is it, am I just going to get a leak in a couple more days when someone walks around on the tub? Yeah. Because, like, things are going to shift or something like I that. I love that that worries you, but you're, like, coming up with the quality programs for a product like the Mama Roo. And but like, I have oh, data. I'm... I have data there. And like, I know it's fixed. Like, I'm like, all right, look, we made X thousand of units this week. And like, I could see that like, it's actually effective. Like, there's measurable data. Like, plumbing, it's like, this thing, it was dripping. And then like, I tightened it. And now it's dripping more. And then I tighten it, or untighten it. It's dripping. Like, I don't know what's going, like, it, I just can't get the model for how the plumbing fixtures are really going to work. That's fair. So. Hey, I don't know. It's got to be a science at some level, like for somebody. Oh, that, I'm sure it is. Like, yeah. and I try to like, I you know, people might give me grief, like, oh, well, the, if the tub was moving, you're not doing. It, it was all cemented, and <laughs> like, you're actually putting put, put, like a mortar cement base, so the tub doesn't move. It was just whatever angles were just not right for the drain from the tub to the the the, the drain stack that was coming in. Ah, uh, brutal. And it was just off enough that if you tighten it, you would kink and move the line like i know the mechanics of what was happening like the yeah. pipes were just moving in a way so that the threads weren't sealing completely around because if you bend the pipe the top ones were probably sealing but the bottom ones weren't and if you went the other way you can't went... just cover it in doping compound and i ended up doing that okay that's what i did i just got i was like teflon tape and f doping. this i was like i didn't even i bothered with that teflon type i got the um teflon paste that nice. they use on gas lines and it said it was good for pvc so i just slathered it and just and it didn't get anything but then again it's still like well, is that going to hold? You know, there's still like this like doubt. Because like there's no test. There's no like, I mean, I kept putting you water like, in. I over pressurize it. I can't pressure because it's a drain line. So, but yeah. like I filled the tub up with all water and then like drained it and like, no, and I had a paper towel under where the leak was. So like any drips you would see immediately. Yeah, makes sense. And I did that a couple of times and there was no issue, but it's like, but maybe. Color-coded water test strips are interesting for stuff like that. Too. Mm. Like, I, I, there was an R&D project I did early in my career where we were trying to make something like pass an ingress protection test mm-hmm. and for like a rookie engineer that is not an easy thing to do i mean i think even for like you know a group that's been out there for a while that is not an easy thing to do i mean sealing robots in general like yeah that, we had to do that a ton pretty, on the solar robots at, at pretty Renzo. Gosh darn tricky and it's like a little piece of dust you're in your o-ring groove water ingress like yeah i mean to the point Slight where like machine irregularity yeah ingress like <laughs> To the point, like, we kind of doubted ourselves. So, like, the, the solar robot, the base of it is actually oil-filled so that if there's any water ingress, like, most of the water will probably just, you know, disperse or move out of the way of the oil or whatever. It won't get in the mechanism. And then the, That's top, interesting. the top part is actually uh, pressurized with a pressure sensor in it. So we actually proactively put air in it. So if there is a small leak, it'll actually see it in the pressure sensor. It'll see it go down. It'll throw an alarm, and the robot will actually autonomously go back. Oh, that's to its cool. starting point so that because we were just getting tired of like we would have leaks 
left and right on these things. And yeah. Because it does have like a, probably like a 30 inch long like O-ring groove on the top of this big thing. It's probably not the best. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it was designed 16 years ago. Um, but like, yeah, we just pressurize it. So then we're like, all right, screw it. If we can't deal with the leak, we can at least monitor if the leak's going to actually happen and at what rate it's happening. But like, yeah, we have shaft steels and like, it's a good, it's a good test for any engineers, like design yeah. something that fully seals in a yeah. crazy environment, especially sewer. Sewer is hard because it's, you know, if you're in the ocean, it's like, all right, you're dealing with ocean, ocean water, ocean pressures, whatever. Sewer, it's like, think of anything you've ever put down a drain. It's there. Drano, like that stuff is super caustic. You got salt. The Drano is, just stays there. It doesn't magically it can, it can, it can. It should disperse, but you can get environments where there's like a little bit of a belly in a pipe. Someone just flushed a bunch of, like they just used a bunch of Drano. It can come in through a lateral and hit your robot. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we've gone into some like buried vaults where I guess it used to be some sort of container and it was just filled with salt water and a robot got stuck and we retrieved it the next day and it was just pitted to hell. All the yeah, aluminum and everything was just pitted to hell. Ate through the anodize everything. Wow! For just twenty four hours in this salt solution. I saw Chuck Whitaker working on something like that. I wonder if it was the same thing, or it must have been a red zone. I'm sure. Thing yeah. he was working on because it was it was some pitted, like it wasn't a solo, but it looked like, like you know, it was like some kind of inspection robot. Yeah, and I mean, so a lot of the red zone, I mean, the red zone responder, which is the big one, that's yep. based on a robot built by. Um, Pioneer, right? I think it was Pioneer, yeah. It went into reactors. I think it actually went to Chernobyl, its predecessor. Yeah. The platform was used, and then that platform was used to create the sewer inspection room. Because there was it's probably still there if it went to Chernobyl, I would, I would assume. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure they left. Some of the people at Red Zone told me stories about, like, hanging out in Chernobyl and how kind of weird it is. And all there is to do is drink vodka. Have you seen those videos of people that go to Pripyat and just, like, hang out? Yeah. Yeah, hang out and then... Yeah, like they got it. They have the little radioactive dissim- stuff that they shouldn't be touching. They have the dosimeters that start going bonkers when you kick up any dust because it's. I mean, you can walk around as long as you don't kick up dust. It's actually pretty benign. But as soon as you, yeah. you go inside of a building or you're out in the forests and stuff, you can but there was like one thing that was like it was like some kind of a grabby boy, mm-hmm. like, and it was like super radioactive and like they were like like going up to it with a Geiger counter and like yeah, like what are you what are you doing <laughs> like why why yeah. It just seems dangerous as hell. Yeah, that that whole radio radioactive stuff is pretty crazy. Yeah, we, I actually have a co-worker. I guess like people like or like I don't know if it's like a pseudoscience, but like some people like try to expose themselves to radiation. Like it's. I think it's the thing is is that with radiation, it's like it's not really tangible, right? Like if there's a big radi- lethal radioactive source sitting right here, like we're never gonna know. We're never gonna know it until one of us like drops over dead. Like, yeah. And even then, we're not going to say it's this thing. We just be like, "Oh, are you okay? You have a heart attack?" Like we're not going to know. Like, just, yeah. And that's the issue with it. So, with your, people don't realize it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And so, you know, if you have some myth about how it might, you know, make you live forever and more virile or whatever, you're just like, "Oh, well, that's." I mean, and like, I don't know if you saw the Chernobyl series on HBO. I did. Yeah, that was. Yeah, like the the Russian military is like, "Oh, drink some vodka, you'll feel fine." And then they run into inside the containment unit to lift up like the graphite off the roof and throw it off at the side and like, yeah. most of those guys the, the firefighters. Yeah, they all pretty much die. It's like yeah. cuz they don't know. It's I think yeah. people know more about radiation now to some degree than they probably did at the time of Chernobyl and even yeah. in the past. So that makes sense. We're always learning more. Yeah. Well, but, because of events like that, you know. Exactly. Unfortunately, yeah. it's because of events like that. Yeah, yeah. that's that's but, why we're a little bit cautious around it. Like, hey, maybe this is uh, dangerous. Yeah, I mean, my coworker, she, she used to work at Westinghouse, would tell stories of like, yeah, like your dissimeter would go off if you either in certain areas of the the reactors or um, if you eat too many bananas. Does Wait, not, what? If you eat too many bananas, so the uh, if bananas, you eat too many bananas, your dissimeter goes off. So one of the more common uh, isotopes of potassium is radioactive. Oh, that's interesting. So if you eat too many bananas and you go to a reactor, they do screen people, and if you have too many bananas, the detector will go off because you have a higher level than what's acceptable to go into the reactor I always for your own the, health. I always thought the dissimeter was like something that monitored environmental radiation. I didn't they they have like a scanner or something before you go into a reactor too. Okay, so they, your dosimeters calibrated the amount. Yeah, they're assuming received. people are coming with a certain level into the reactor. Yeah. So they give you the dosimeter after, but they scan you before you get in to make sure. And then the dosimeter looks at the delta. The del- what you've that, incurred in the environment of yeah, the reactor and everything. Sense. So, but yeah, if you've had too much, they're not going to give you dosimeter because you've already exceeded the baseline that they're. Yeah. Yeah, you're cut off for the rest of your life. Yeah, I think you have like a week. Actually, it's like a week or something. You can't go in. 
Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it dissipates. I so mean, your body, yeah, that, that's it works through the isotopes and goes away. So if you're flying all the time, or if you're an astronaut or something. Yeah, you know it's funny. <laughs> I always wondered that. They're like, oh yeah, if you fly a lot, you, you're exposed to more radiation. So I was thinking like all my trips to Southeast Asia. Yeah. I wonder how much I've dosed up on radiation <laughs> from all those trips. What are you doing in Southeast Asia? All oh, the, the manufacturing for oh, cool. for mom. So yeah, they're like. I haven't been there in the last. I just thought of Southeast Asia, three? like Vietnam and Thailand, but it sounded like a lot of your manufacturing was in China. So. Yeah, South. It's, yeah, it's, it's uh, South China specifically. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I haven't been there in. Well, it's a combination of my son was born in 2019, and then the pandemic hit. So I haven't no, been there sense. since 2018. End of 2018, I think it was my last trip. So my son was born, so. It's amazing how much you can do remote anymore. Like it's. I mean, that was a big test. Like yeah. otherwise, like my usual routine was, I would go there about four times, four to six times a year for about yeah. a week or more to like you know, see the fact. And you definitely still do more. It, it's about as often as I was going to the Bay Area around the same time. Yeah. So like you go there and you spend about a week or two, and you definitely get a lot more done because you like you can sit there with the team, talk with them, and you know have hands on actions versus remote, where you know it's. The, the 13 hour, well, now it's a 13 hour shift, but 12 to 13 hour time shift. And basically, yeah. you have to wait every morning or every evening to get direct communication. Yeah. I've also noticed like the phenomenon with one of the downsides of remote work, in my observation, is you know how you have people like running around as gophers for the person on the other end. And so, you really, your concept of what's going on is only as good as what you can th see through their cell phone camera or like what they took a picture of or. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're pulling someone else away from other tasks by making them be your eyes and you know hands. Yeah, I mean, the... for moms, we have a team of um, folks who are living. There's a part of the team lives in mainland China. We have a part of the team that lives in Hong Kong, and the mainland team have only been the ones that have been able to get into the factories, um, and they send us pictures and videos and stuff as best they can. The factory workers team also send us stuff as much as they can, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely different than being there, but thankfully we're in the age of smartphones and things like that, so you can actually take Well, the tech is video. getting better. Yeah, you can take, like, actual decent video. Like, I can't even imagine doing what we do now. Well, I don't want to say 10 years ago. The iPhone's been around for more than that, so 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Like, I can't even imagine doing it. I guess the things I've seen that have been, like, failure modes of that are, like, I guess one is a mission. So if, like, yeah. the person on the other end doesn't know what to take a picture of, that can, that can cause an error by a mission. Yeah. And then the other one... Um, is I guess like you said or alluded to resolution. So right. if your resolution's not good and you can't see like a trace on a circuit board, or it could be the cameras out of focus. And yeah, so. I mean the one we struggle with is um, noise. So like if we have a gearbox that's out of spec, it'll make a noise. But like when you take a video recording of something making noise, volume is very dependent on how close you are to the product. Well, and all these cameras now have noise cancellation features where right. it's designed to emit that type of detail. Yeah, so a lot of times if we can't find something obvious and debug it, we have to just have them ship the unit to us so we can get a live like, read on it. But then even then, like we've had cases where things change in shipping. The package gets jostled, gets drop kicked out of the UPS truck when it gets arrives. <laughs> like, things change. So like, yeah, there's, there's challenges with that. But Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I, I think it's nice to be remote but yeah especially with hardware and product you, you still have to be very much hands-on yeah. like working the office i'll be in one or two times a week and i've spent probably the last three years actually building up my garage to do a lot more stuff at home that's so. pretty cool well and it's it's interesting to know that even the scale that four moms works at that's the case because mm -hmm. i mean on the one hand i feel like the cad and the simulation software is getting better and that sort of increases the amount you can do remotely as well i mean the fact that <laughs> You know, you can have 30 of these things that are almost the same as the 30 over there, but they're still not quite the same. And right. There might be factors, you know, in between. Like, that's that's interesting to me. Yeah. Because it, it does seem like one way around, at least at lower quantities of production, you know, like the phenomenon of only having, like, one of a thing on an early prototype is right. to just build four of them. And then, you know, different centers get one and... You can at least sort of replicate issues that way, but yeah. it just seems like you have a whole different set of things you're chasing at the scales you're working at. Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong, when we're doing a new prototype for either a new generation Mamaru or a new product, like in the early stages, you only have like one because you're, you're 3D printing it, and the investment in a 3D print full scale model can be anywhere from five, 10 grand, something like that. So yeah, having sense. 10 of these or something doesn't make sense. Plus, 
you don't have too much reliability potentially in the RP because sometimes these RPs are so big they have to be glued together, so there's variations in the glue up. What's an things. RP? Uh, rapid prototype. So Got it. 3D okay. print. Got it. So like we'll do since our all our stuff is um, injection molded, we do a lot of 3D print. Usually yeah, SDM um, for the big stuff, and if we have any small fine detail stuff, we'll do like an SLA resin printer or something like that. Yeah. SLS has been a game changer. For, SLS is yeah. great for, um, we use it for anything where we want really realistic um, material performance. So we want it to act like an actual nylon piece or an actual like acetone piece. Because you can actually have it made out of that material. Because that, yeah, it's exactly, it's, it's the actual powder and they just center it together. And the performance of it is actually pretty good. It's it's uh, isotropic, so it actually performs pretty, pretty close to like the same in all directions. FDM. It's just very, it performs well in one direction. Yeah, you're sheer. Yeah, we shear similar. stuff. We try to, if the design allows it, if it's really just looking for tension and compression in a certain area, we'll try to print it in the orientation, but sometimes you just can't, so. Makes sense. Um, we actually don't, I would say, we probably don't do a ton of like complex machining at Four Moms, just because, again, all our parts are injection molded. Yeah. Or if there's metal, just because of cost, like it's usually ba very basic, like it's a rod that's cut to a certain length or a bushing or. Uh, stamped piece of sheet metal or something like that. Yeah, makes sense. So, do you ever deal with like uh, what is the high pressure uh, metal molding or like die casting or? Something? Oh, so yeah, we did. Um, it wasn't intentional. We actually did like a metal injection molding. Yeah, metal we, injection molding. Yeah, Sorry, it, wasn't, it wasn't intentional, but we designed a part for our um, car seat. It was a metal gear, and then another metal part. And they gave it to us, and I was looking at it, I was like, I don't see any machining marks or anything on this. And they're like, oh, it's not machined. And like, they're, they, the, the, the folks that the contract manufacturer in, in China, they, they, they start talking back and forth. And I'm like, oh, we, well, what, what process is it? And they're going back and forth and talking. It's actually kind of normal working in China. That's how it is sometimes. Like, they'll, yeah. they'll talk. And, and then they turn to like, oh, um, injection mold. It's like, this is metal. They're like, yeah. metal injection mold. I was like, and this is like before, like even the iWatch, because like I only heard of metal injection molding from when the uh, Apple Watch came out. Yeah. They were hyping it up, so I didn't even know it was a thing. And they're like, "Oh yeah, metal injection." And then they like showed me like they're like, "Oh, this is where the gate is, and this is where like it flowed." I was like, "Holy crap, that's pretty awesome!" And I was like, "That's cheaper than machine." They're like, "Oh, much cheaper." I was that's like, wild. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> much cheaper. <laughs> So yeah, it was like I said, it wasn't intentional. I was just like make this part because sometimes that's what we do. We just like make this thing, and yeah, in cases we don't need a specific material other than like make it metal. They ran off and found a process to do it. And that's it was awesome. Great. Yeah, that uh, it seems like a lot of fun. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to build things at those quantities yet. I mean, it's it's scary. It's also takes it's a lot of investment. I mean, yeah, like millions of dollars for tools, depending on how many tools you need. But then like it makes sense, right? Because yeah. a tool can last anywhere from half a million to several million parts. So like if yeah. you're good with a design and you want to make millions of them, most like an in canal. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's uh, it's just like a hardened steel. It's okay. nothing really super fancy. I think, it, it, I mean, it can get fancy. There's definitely ones that use like um, more uh, exotic metals like beryllium copper, which yeah. is a very good heat conductor. So if you have a part that's like really deep and narrow you need to pull a lot of heat out of that pot part before it basically starts to warp crazily so you'll your tool surface will be made from these inserts that are beryllium copper which apparently is oh very that's cool. interesting so you use a less expensive metal for the whole thing then you have the beryllium copper is there that's what contacts the part it contacts the part sinks heat away better yep yeah apparently it's Probably very like toxic it. stuff if you like breathe in the dust i would i would think maybe like an aluminum component behind that or potentially i mean so the brilliant copper i think is like one of the better from a like heat conduction standpoint normally it's just tool steel then you have water lines embedded in the steel that yeah. they pump cold water through and it pulls all the heat out as i've seen that with like cross drilling and then plugging on either yep. side yeah yep. that's those are all the cooling lines yeah they'll drill across and then they'll plug when because you basically want well depending what you're doing you want to try to maximize cooling so like some paths will have like all the the cool water inlet on one side and then all the, the spent heated water on the other side. But then like that gives you a temper, temperature differential. Like this side's always gonna be colder yeah, so part than this side. So when you take your part out, the side that's warm is actually gonna start to warp potentially. Oh no. So then you have cooling designs like you do a zigzag. Well then the zigzag's great in some cases, but like the upper part is always gonna be warmer than the lower part. So you have to be considerate of like, is that okay for your part? Like yeah. knowing that this part is going to be warmer down here, is that warpage going to be a problem? That's interesting. Yeah, it seems like there's not 
an easy way to counter that. I guess you could flow water faster. You, you do simulations, so we do like mold flow. So the mold, yeah. mold flow and cooling flow. So mold flow models the flow of plastic through the part. So you want to make sure that when you push plastic into a certain pressure, it reaches all the extremities of the part. Yep. Uh, so making sure the plastic flows correctly is the first phase. And then the second phase is like once it's in place, you got to do the cooling lines. And they, they play in each other because like if you have too much cooling, you can freeze off the plastic before it ever gets to the end of the, the part. Oh, that's interesting. So like yeah, you, you can have a short shot is what it's called. So like the plastic will freeze before it ever gets. So like you get these parts out and it's like kind of just like wavy void. at the end. Or you get a <laughs> void or something like that. Void is um, its own special thing. Like you can have, if it's too thick, the um, plastic... As it cools, it basically it wants to pull away from each other. So if you have a part that's too thick, the plastic rips itself away from itself and makes it you have a void, which is oh, that's a vacuum in it. I I would have thought of like a short shot as like just having missing bits. When I said void, that's what I meant. But I see what you're saying now. Yeah. So a short shot, like if so, if you had this yeah. glass and you squirt plastic in here, yeah, the the plastic would go up, and if it was a short shot, it would only come up to like here or something. Yeah, and you might have like a wavy. Like, You'd something. have like a wavy edge because it's like it's literally just think Half of a fluid flowing. Yeah. yeah. And then there's things like that we deal a lot of since our parts are a lot of uh, very cosmetic uh, weld lines. So if you have a, a circle and you have plastic coming from the side, the plastic flow leader uh, edge has to go around that, but then those two edges come together. And when yeah. they come together, they're not, the front edge is always very cold. When those two edges come together, they don't perfectly fuse. So what you, when you have the finished part and you look at the hole, um, the side opposite of where the plastic started, you'll see this little tiny line. Ah, so you gotta put that somewhere where so it's So you have hidden. to figure out like how to deal with that. So like the yeah. Mamaru, when we do our front UI, there's. At least on the floor, it was a lot worse. It was a big opening. But like where the flow came around was this little tiny edge that was actually on a vertical surface towards the bottom. So no one ever saw it. But like, right. if I took the part and looked at it, I could see a little line. So you just obfuscate that by mounting it in a way where it's... You try to obfuscate yeah. it through like, you know, changing the location where the plastic comes in. You can obfuscate it by adding more points for the plastic to come in. Interesting. But then like you can have two flow lines here. If you have two plastic gates on either side... Um, but you never get rid of it entirely. You can change the temperature and try to keep that front edge as hot as possible. So when they yeah. fuse, they actually fuse pretty well. But then your cycle time probably goes up if you do that, I would think. Yeah, so cycle time is a big part that comes into the cost. So like yeah. every machine costs a certain amount per hour. So if you're part, the part, like the actual molding process is like seconds or fractions of a second. So like you basically squirt all the plastic, it's in the place where it needs to be in less than like two seconds. But a cycle time for a part can be 15 seconds to like two minutes, depending on the size of it. All that is doing is just sitting there cooling it. Yeah. It's just holding the plastic and then the water's going through the tool to pull that heat out. So that when you get it out, you want the part to be as cool as possible. So dimensionally it stays the shape it needs to be, but you don't want it to be in there so long that your cycle time is going through the roof and it's yeah. costing you money. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So sometimes what we'll do is, um, you know, ideally the part comes out, it's perfect and you don't have to worry about it, but sometimes the part comes out and you gotta pull it on a fixture which basically like holds parts from basically like pulling it. Oh, that so. makes sense, yeah. So like our high chair. The fixture is probably pinning the dimensionally uh, important bits rather. Yeah, so our high chair, yeah, it it's, it's, it's a seat, right? It's got arms and a backrest. And when it comes out, it's still warm and it wants the armrest parts of the chair actually want to pull in. <laughs> so you actually have to have a fixture after it comes out of the part out of the the press, so you're you can't, not spending press time on. We don't it. want to spend press time and money on it, so we actually have a fixture that the seat goes in and it holds the armrest out at the point where it should be, so that after it fully cools, it actually stays at that dimension. And then you free up that fixture and use it for the next part. Yeah, so they'll have like a dozen of these fixtures, so yeah. that like as they come out, they'll put it on, and then the ones that have cooled off, they'll throw into the, the work in progress pile. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, texture molds, interesting stuff. And actually, I, I still haven't really had any opportunity to work with them at all yet, and it just seems like a lot of fun. I don't know. Yeah, I, I only dowled it with it mean, a I little bit in at, at Red Zone. We had these little covers we needed for the uh, IR sensors on the solar robot, but we were burning through them at like... I think I saw those at the Discovery Day. Probably, yeah. 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 There, there's three of them on the front, around each camera, and then there's actually a plastic dome over the lights and then on the, the le front lines. Apparently people steal those at trade shows thinking they're swag. Probably. I mean, they're cheap. Like, they're all injection molded, so we, yeah. we got them all sent out to... We actually used Protomold because I didn't know anything about injection mold at the time. I was just <laughs> like, oh, well, how do you injection mold? And Google's like, Protomold! So we used them and it's definitely not the right way to go. I mean, it's the right way to go if you need something quick and in like a hundred-ish quantity or a thousand quantity. But if you want to do like tens of thousands or millions, like 
you got to go to like actual like injection mold manufacturer. Yeah, it makes sense. But, but yeah, how does cool. Proto Mold get at that that cheap for those quantities? They usually do a um, uh, aluminum tool. Oh, okay. So instead of big steel, so it wears like, out really fast. Yeah. So they and yeah. Probably machine. Marks. That's why you only get like a hundred to a thousand pieces yeah. because yeah, every shot deforms the metal a little bit because it's done at like such a high pressure the metal moves yeah, so they can sense. only guarantee like dimensional accuracy for a hundred to a thousand shots yeah. some cases they can just make multiple of the aluminum tools yeah, that makes you like a thousand or something like that but your unit cost is it's higher than um what mass scale injection molding would be but it's cheaper than saying if you were to get each of those parts like machined yeah makes sense yeah. that's interesting yeah. yeah uh anything you want to plug uh well talked about Mamaru, so four moms. Check buy out. Mamaru. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> buy Mamaru, buy Mamaru Sleep, buy Play Yard. The Even if you play don't yard. have kids, buy Mamaru. If you know someone who has kids, it's definitely a great uh, treat. Um, <laughs> buy two as foot rests and <laughs> jiggle your feet. Probably put a small, if you have a small pet, a cat. There's definitely <laughs> lots of videos online of cats in the Mamaru or small dogs in the Mamaru. <laughs> so you can use that. All right, and if you've listened this far, subscribe to uh, Collaborative with Spencer Krauss on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. And buy Custom Robots and Machines engineering services from SKA, Custom Robots and Machines. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me.